how much is this crazy up and down weather wreaking havoc on your garden? Not to mention all that salt for roads or sidewalks may be finding its way to your plants. The Chicago Botanic Gardens Eliza Fournier is here to provide advice and tips for you. Eliza, welcome to the Afternoon Chef. Thanks for having me. So let's start with a caller. And if you have questions, again, the number 312-923-9239, or you can use Facebook or Twitter for questions as well. Amy, you're on the air. What's your question? Well, thank you for taking my call. Um, I live in Chicago, and in 2012, I planted six different varieties of dwarf fruit trees in the vacant lot next door. And now I'm wondering about pruning in the winter. I I read that I need to prune the apple tree while things are dormant down to five branches. And I wondered if it was the same. I have pear, plum, apricot, and cherry, and peach. Thanks, Amy. Yeah, Amy, um, great, a great question. And absolutely, this is a great, great time to prune fruit trees of all types. Um, you want to do it in the winter because, one, you can see the branching structure a little bit better. You can see what you're cutting and um, where you're going. And fruit trees, it's a little bit different than planting our orna- uh, pruning our ornamental plants because you kind of want to get pretty aggressive with them because the more you prune, the more that they will um, produce fruits and the b- branches will be stronger to support the fruit that they, that they do produce. Um, last year was an amazing... Because we in 2012 we had that crazy late spring mm-hmm. frost that killed all the blossoms. So this year was a, a phenomenal fruiting year. So a lot of branches actually were overladen with a lot of fruit. Um, so this is a great time to prune prune all of those fruit trees. And you know you don't have to get crazy with it. You can wait till it gets above 20 degrees. You and know, you general rule. Yourself. What's your general rule of thumb for pruning? Like how, what kind of philosophy do you have, particularly with fruit trees? Uh, well, the first thing, and this is something I wanted to talk about anyways, because what do we do as Chicago gardeners in the middle of winter? You want to make sure that your tools that you're using are sharp and clean um, because you can still spread disease and damage your plants um, even in the winter. So make sure that the pruners that you're using, one, you're using the right tool for the right job. So if you have um, a branch, say the size of your pinky or even your pointer, that's the job for like a hand pruner. But if you have anything bigger than that, you want to move up to a lopper, anything up to the size of maybe like a, a... child's forearm. Um, And then anything beyond that, you want to be using a handsaw. So make sure you're using the right tool for the right job. Um, The other thing is make sure you're not leaving too much of the stump um, of the branch that you're cutting um, sticking out because that'll be make it hard for the wound to heal. And likewise, don't cut it too close to the, the trunk of the tree because then that'll also make it the wound hard to heal. So you want to just hit that sweet spot. And there's lots of phenomenal um, photos online um, on our website at the Chicago Botanic Garden. Or even if you just Google it, you can find lots of um, document or diagrams about where you should make the cut. Mm -hmm. That's the Chicago Botanic Garden's Eliza Fournier. She's the Urban Youth Programs Director. She's here with us in studio to answer your questions about gardening. 312-923-9239. So we started by talking about the extreme weather. And you mentioned there were some things what gardeners are to do in the winter. And I want to get back to that in a second. But first, I just wanted to ask about this up and down cold. And we've seen, it was almost, I think, between this past Monday and this Monday two weeks ago, what did we have almost an 80 degree difference in temperature? If you were counting wind chill, we had what, from 40 below to almost 50. What does that do to plants? Should we be concerned about that? Yeah, um, it is extreme. But the good thing about us in Chicago and our plants is that we're used to it. I mean, we're always talking about the crazy weather. You know, since time immortal, we've been talking about the crazy weather. So if you're planting plants, trees, shrubs in your garden that are kind of suited for this zone 5, 5A, 5B um, type weather or 4, 3, 2, um, you should be fine. Um, the one thing you can do, if, if not, you can use actually our tools that Mother Nature has given us, like all of this beautiful snow, as actually a layer of insulation for your plants. So if you did plant some more tender perennials, when you're shoveling, you mentioned shoveling doing mm-hmm. double duty. Pile that snow on top of the the roots of those tender perennials, and it'll actually serve as extra and added clean insulation. snow. Because clean snow, yes. Okay. So as long as it's clean, pile it on. But do you have to be gentle about it? Are you? Would you be worried about branches breaking? Or are there some plants that are too delicate to handle a snow layer? 
Right. And maybe some of you even saw with your evergreens, your broadleaf evergreens and your needled evergreens that um, your you were seeing a lot, the snow got really heavy. And then when it started to melt and then we got that weird rain and then the ice formed, you really want to, when we get a heavy snow like that, you want to brush gently, brush off the snow from your evergreens um, because it will lead to permanent damage, either branches breaking that could be, um, you, you'll notice in the spring or like, Arborvitaes are an evergreen that's very popular in the Chicago area. And you'll notice they when they bend like that, when they kind of split from the middle and even start to bend over, sometimes that can be permanent. So just shaking gently that snow off of the trees can be um, very, very helpful. What about salt? Salt can be very, very damaging to plants. Um, uh, if anyone has ever done an experiment for a science project or anything where they put salt into soil, you can it ta- you know that it kills plants almost immediately. Um, so for the home gardener who loves and cares about the plants that he or she has put in and tended to so lovingly, ease up on the salt. Um, you can use other things um, for traction that are more natural. Sand. Uh, we use a lot of sand. That's what you use at the, at botanic, the botanic garden. garden. Yeah, mm-hmm. we use a lot of sand at the botanic garden. Um, ash. Um, from a fireplace um, can also work. Um, sawdust, if you happen to be a woodworker or something like that, you can use sawdust just to provide more traction. It's not going to melt the snow and ice like ice will, but it's going to protect your plants. Um, also, if you have plants that are planted next to um, a street, um, particularly evergreens can be uh, susceptible to this. You might even want to go the extra step to protecting them with some burlap. Um, held up by fence posts or something like that. Mm -hmm. That's Eliza Fournier with the Chicago Botanic Garden. She's here in studio with us to talk about gardening, particularly now in the winter. And Eliza, I was wondering, especially as we've seen this fluctuation and we had a lot of snow and then it's melting and now it's snowing again, does the excess of water when snow melts hurt plants? Because the ground is frozen. So I'm just wondering where that water goes and if that runoff affects your garden, for example. If you have, uh, typically it's not it's not going to have a deleterious effect to plants. Um, it's, you know, your basement might be another story or um, you, you what the one thing you want to look out for, and there's not really much you can do about it, is notice where the water does pool in your yard. And you might just want to get plants that... Um, can handle that kind of excess water because come spring when plants do start to be sprouting, that's when it's going to have an effect on them. So we you actually pre planning. Well, we have a caller who has a question mm-hmm. about this. Dan in Lincolnshire, you're on the afternoon shift. What's your question? It was exactly that. I I have an area of what should be lawn with grass planted that um, is is a ditch. The water pools in it, and in particularly in the spring when the melting snow. I mean, it's it can stay. Uh, standing water for you know a week or, or or more, and I was wondering what, short of putting in some drainage system, what I might plant there instead of grass that would uh, help alleviate that and would thrive in that in that in that low uh, area in the lawn yeah, that's water. A good, that's a good question, Dan. I bet a lot of people have this situation. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and the great news is you have a perfect location for a rain garden. And rain gardens are a thing that's become a lot more um, popular lately. Instead of fighting against Mother Nature and just beating our heads against the wall, trying to plant, make something grow that's just never going to grow in the area, in the conditions that we have in our yard, is working with Mother Nature to really have an area that could be gorgeous, attract wildlife, actually serve as a a natural filter for groundwater. I mean, we have so many non-porous surfaces, especially in the Chicagoland area area that anywhere we can kind of preserve water and let it go through the ground a lot more slowly, that's going to help all of our drinking water. So thanks, Dan, for you know giving us that resource. <laughs> really appreciate it. And there are tons. If you Google rain garden, there are tons of plant lists that will come up um, immediately. There's lots of the great thing is that uh, rain gardens also have a lot of plants that will attract um, wildlife and butterflies and birds too. So flag, blue flag iris are, is one that comes to mind. Some types of milkweed also really, really love that um, on, on the edges of that rain garden. So you can plant a lot of beautiful plants there. Question that we got from Twitter. Someone has a little bear's lime tree and they said it's getting some good sun, but the trip home caused it to lose all but three leaves. And then this person just rams and says, help. Oh, 
this is sad. Uh, about 10 years ago, I bought my husband a key lime tree. And I thought, what a great, for Valentine's Day, because he does love a gin and tonic. And he thought, what a better um, present for my love than this key lime tree. And I honestly, um, I've never seen a lime tree growing outside of a greenhouse situation in Chicago that has had more than three leaves. They will, mind you, they will. Would they bear, would they? They'll no. hang on. They'll hang but on with there three be leaves. Any limes? <laughs> there will be. Um, the lime may get the size of your pinky nail. Okay, it's a little smaller than a key lime, yeah, in other a little, words. A little bit smaller yeah. than a key lime. Um, the thing is, in Chicago, a lot of our houseplants suffer over the winter. We just do not have the consistent temperature. The, con- the humidity is really, I mean, you can give that plant all the sunlight in the world, but with the the heat blowing yeah. on it and then the dry air, it's just never going to be extremely happy. Yeah, um, my banana palm is pretty unhappy right now. Yeah, <laughs> it's just, that. and then they can make a comeback if they can make it through the winter and then you can let them go outside, um, you know, June through August, you know, they can make a comeback, but then you're just going to watch them suffer again through another winter so. like we all do, you know, <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> so hang in there or all not. Right. <laughs> So that's uh, Eliza Fournier from the Chicago Botanic Garden. We're going to take a break, but when we come back, more on winter gardening with her. And your questions, 312-923-9239. Light snow throughout the region, but don't worry, we are talking about bringing green back into your lives with Eliza Fournier. Good afternoon. I'm Nyla Boodoo. You're listening to the Afternoon Shift. Eliza from the Chicago Botanic Garden is here to answer your questions about gardening. 312-923-9239. Eliza, a question we got on Twitter, how early is a sane time to start cold weather seeds indoors like kale? I love that it says as a sane time, you know. (laughs) Well, a sane time to get your um your cool season crop started. It's kind of, it's right around the corner. I mean, it's not too early to really start thinking about that now. Um it depends, you know, the earlier you start, the bigger the starts you're going to be have when you take them outside. So, all your cool season um crops like lettuce, Kale, Swiss chard, collard greens. Um, in the next, I would say in two weeks, would probably be a great time to get those going. And they can go outside pretty when it's still pretty cold. Um, you might want to, if we get big snow. What is pretty cold? Um, say in still in freezing, you know, okay. still in fr- freezing weather. But the thing is, they're going to be new and they're going to be used to the warmth of your house. So you're going to have to get them used to it. Um, another thing that I would recommend is if you're going to do that, if you really want to get a jump on it, it's best that you have some kind of rudimentary kind of cold frame. And that can be as simple as say you have a raised bed. Um, taking some PVC and um, bending it over the bed to make kind of a hoop. Okay. Um, like or half a hula hoop, and then doing that a couple of times, and then getting some heavy duty plastic sheeting, not like a garbage bag that sun can't get through, but something that's clear. Put it over it, and that's going to protect it from the extreme cold. Just to transition it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And then keep it up. And then if we get uh, heavy snows too, that'll protect it from the heavy snow too. Mm-hmm. That's Eliza Fournier with Chicago Botanic Garden. Valerie in Chicago, you had a question about whether it's too late to plant something. Hi, Valerie. Are you there? Okay. It looks like Valerie's question was, is it too late to plant garlic? I, I can't imagine trying to plant anything <laughs> right now because, honestly, if you go outside and try to stick a shovel into the ground, you're not going to have much success. Um, so I would say it's too late to plant garlic. But really, uh, up till, uh, you know, right around Thanksgiving was not too late. You still could stick a shovel in the ground. So if you're contemplating planting garlic next year, d- you know, it can go pretty late. I mean, you really don't even want to plant it till it gets pretty um, pretty cold, like into the 30s at night and stuff. So absolutely. Okay. 312-923-9239. Alyssa, you're on the afternoon shift. Hi there. I'm calling because I uh, I live on a corner, um, and there's a lot of people. I, I'm in Chicago, and there's street parking uh, on the on my block. Um, 
is very it's very narrow. I'm wondering if there's something that besides grass that I could plant on the verge between the sidewalk and the street so that when people park up on the lawn there, it could it can handle it a little bit better. Uh, I also live on a corner, so I I hear your pain. Um, there's a lot. Um, there is a lot of one grass is kind of hard to maintain too. So particularly if you have a lot of street trees, um, grass is a very heavy feeder, um, water and nutrient wise, and it's really hard. It does, doesn't compete with trees well, particularly if you have, say, a Norway maple that throws some pretty deep shade. So it's it is nice to think about um, what else you can plant there. Um, <sighs> the one thing I would warn you uh, against when doing that is that people will, because you have a lot of people parking there, people will walk across whatever is planted there. So uh, maybe just trying to create um, actual paths that you don't care about if people walk, and hopefully they'll respect those. So maybe putting a couple of stepping stones or um, maybe fencing off areas where of, of plants that you maybe do care about more. Um, and it's if you have a really sunny area, um, planting lower evergreens like junipers that can really handle, they can handle, they're pretty salt tolerant. Also, very drought tolerant. They can and they can be low growing too, so they create kind of this ground cover. Um, if you have a shady area, um, hostas are great. Um, Pachysandra can also do well. You just want to make sure that you're not trying to compete too much with the trees because that's a battle that you're just not going to win. Um, also, people sometimes will take the route of trying to build up a raised bed around their tree, and so they have more soil to plant in because tree roots can be kind of shallow. That is ultimately only going to harm the tree. So don't try not a to idea. do not try to mound up soil um, up to create a, a, a bed if your tree is planted low. Um, that's just going to create um, rot on your bark, and diseases and pests are going to get in there. And with all of the emerald, uh, with all of that ash trees that we're going to be losing in our street trees. We don't want to, we want to keep all of the street trees that we can healthy. I want to take a call, but because just because you mentioned ash, I just wanted to ask about uh, the emerald ash borer, the invasive beetle. And I saw some reports that their larvae can survive up to 22 below zero. So this cold isn't going to kill them off. Right. There have been some stories that going around about that this might be a good thing for killing off invasive species. And a lot of those stories are coming out of Minnesota, where it has stayed for you 20. I mean, we think it's cold here and this is nothing compared to what they're getting in Minnesota or have gotten, which is tw- that 20 degree that below story zero. I was in Minnesota. Yeah, for like weeks on end. Um, we've got it for, it felt horrible, but it was okay, only like two days. for two, three days. Right. And that's just really not going to be enough to reduce populations by any significant amount. Unfortunately, these are tough little buggers. Oh boy. Okay. Mm-hmm. Getting back to uh, your other point, Janice in Arlington Heights, what was your question? My question is, I had a very late uh, fall uh, cleanup, trying to gather up the money, and it was pretty expensive. But then two days later, it snowed, and from then on, there wasn't a chance to put mulch on or leaves. So this poor flower, and I have a great, it was a great flower bed, unprotected with the snow on. It's, what can I do? Uh, like when the snow gets away, what can I do to help these poor flowers underneath? Well, good news that the snow is actually, it's really good that it snowed. And actually, if you see if it snows again, what I would do is just put more snow on top of that flower clean bed. Snow. Clean snow. Not salt-covered snow, but clean snow. Pile it on top of those beds, and that's actually going to serve as insulation um, for your plants. And also, when it melts, it's going to give them that great start for spring. So do not worry about the snow. If we do have a long period of um, of snow melt and we don't get another covering of snow, that's when you might want to start worrying. Um if, especially because it's a newer bed and the plants haven't gotten had a chance to get established. The one thing is it's a little hard to find mulch um, right now in the garden centers. And um, so if you have any that you happen to have laying around or straw or something like that, you could do it. I wouldn't worry about it 
too too much um you just have to see if they make you it. just yeah mm-hmm. at this point you just just see if they make, pile all the snow you can on top of those mm-hmm. babies so uh, eliza fournier with chicago botanic garden is here with us to answer your questions 312-923-9239 robin in rogers park you're on the air hi um i i my yard gets hardly any sunlight it's staple sunlight and somebody told me to plant a juga because it stays low and it spreads and that's what I wanted. And it didn't come back. It didn't spread. It like it spread the first year a little bit and then the next year nothing. Hmm. What did I do wrong? Hmm. That is the thing that I love about horticulture and gardening, that just as soon as you think you have the perfect solution, Mother Nature will just throw a curveball at you. And for whatever reason, I mean, you can have, I had two hydrangeas, the exact same ones from the exact same nursery, bought at the same time, planted in the exact same time. One thrived, one died. Why? I don't know. I would I would have recommended the same thing, that you plant a juca in your yard. Um, the one thing that might... Um, if Sometimes shady areas um, that have been... Um, not used as gardens before, they can be very compact. So maybe that was one part of the issue is that the soil maybe was not very rich in nutrients and or structure and it didn't have good structure. So maybe taking a little bit more time and amending the soil so you the next time you do try a plant that it has a good a good start. Um, so adding, adding compost, mulching the area, even if you don't have plants there, all of that will help the soil to um, regain a good structure and then and help you to not um, waste your time and energy and money on any plants that you put in in the future. Uh, Eliza from the Chicago Botanic Gardens, that's her, and she. we were talking about <laughs> planting and gardening, uh, taking your questions and calls, and you mentioned uh, your hydrangea and flowering, and just wondering if we can think about spring and when you should come back and answer spring questions, but also what time of year do we started by saying you know, people were asking about seeds and when can you start, but when can we put, move them into the ground? Um, well, I'll come back anytime, Nyla. So I love being here. Um, so uh, when can you start putting things in the ground? Uh, some of the crops, perennials, shrubs, trees, um, all of that, you really, the ground takes a while to thaw out. So it's going to be late April, May. Also, you don't really want to, I was talking about soil structure a little bit before, you don't want to be digging in the soil when it's so saturated with water, um, because that's really going to break down. It's going to make your beautiful loamy soil that I know we all have in Chicago. I kind of say that a little tongue in cheek because we tend to have either really sandy or really clay soil. Um, but it's going to make it even. It's going to exacerbate those conditions. So don't rush it. Um, but at the same time, I know we're all gardeners and we can't not rush it. So there's some things that you can plant. If you love planting, um, if you want to plant an edible garden, the best thing to plant early, as soon as you can um, get into the ground, is peas. And they're the most delicious treat. And you can plant them. I mean, I, I planted them second week of March last year. And they're also something you kind of forget about. You're thinking about the other things, and then it's too late to plant them. So get those babies into the ground, and you'll have a very tasty, sweet treat come, you know, end of May, middle of May. 312-923-9239. We have a few more uh, minutes to take some more calls. Jane, you're on the afternoon shift. Hi, how are you doing? Good, Jane. Okay, I, I have a, I actually have kind of a funny question. I've been growing um, European mandrakes in my basement for a couple of years. Um, the, the same ones that are in the Harry Potter movie. <laughs> okay. <laughs> just, just, uh, just to give people an idea. And um, I know that they are not, I know that it's too cold in the, in the Chicago area for them by about a zone and a half. So I'm trying to create a microclimate and... I, I want to find out if my idea for microclimate, you think it might be good enough. I, I'm, gonna, I'm going to build a, kind of a slightly raised sandy bed so they get enough drainage and make sure that I put plenty of boulders um, to the west and maybe a little bit to the east. And then um, I'm hoping, I, I, I figure if it looks like it's going to get really cold, I'll, I'll probably mulch them really well, but if it gets really, it really cold, I'll close them as well. Do you have any other suggestions for what I might do? Uh, well, you sound committed to the mandrakes, so I'm not going to discourage you at all. <laughs> um, but another thing that you might consider is just keeping them in their pots 
and just sinking them into that bed that you've created um, and then taking them out and bringing them into the wonderful habitat that you've created inside for them and overwintering them inside. That's just an I, – my – I know people who have beautiful cacti collections, and that's what they do. They just create like this kind of ready-made habitat, and then the cacti just get plunked in and plunked out um, in depending on the season. So that might be something to think about. Uh, in keeping with the climate and not suitable question, we had a question on Facebook about sycamore and London Plain going to be removed. Are they suited to our climate? Huh, I haven't heard. Honestly, I have not heard a lot about that. Um, but they grow native in Indiana, all over the place. So they're they ne- they never lo- they uh, they they never look quite robust and healthy. Their leaves always look kind of sickly. But they're they're fine. Um, someone can correct me on that if I'm if I'm off base. But um, and they're they're quite indigenous to Indiana, which is very close to us. So okay. Uh, 312-923-9239. It looks like we have a couple questions about dogwoods. Let's take one. Uh, Catherine in Oak Park, you're on the air. Hi. Yeah, I kind of got seduced by these nice warm winters, and I took a chance and put in a Cherokee dogwood last spring. Do you think it's going to make it? Oh, that I could tell the future. I would be a horticulturist extraordinaire. Um, I Hopefully... You, you, well, it sounds like you knew you were taking a risk. And hopefully because you knew you were taking a risk, you planted it in a, like the woman with the mandrakes before was talking about trying to find a microclimate in your yard that would be more suitable. So protected from north winds, maybe up against a building, um, you know, protected by other plants and trees around it. Um, And if you did that and you mulched it in well and it got a great start last season, I mean, fingers crossed. Um... Just remember there's next winter and the winter after that. And yeah, just another dogwood question I just saw a red stem dogwood that's hardly ever red. What should she be doing? Um, uh, the, the, for the red twig dogwood, um, the a great thing to do is this is really scary, but you can do some major aggressive rejuvenation pruning because the the stems do turn um, browner as they age. So if you're not a prepared to take all of the stems off if you for whatever reason you want the screening you want the privacy whatever you can go in and take a third of the stems out all the way to the ground like almost just leaving an inch to an inch and a half um, from the ground and then they will sprout up brand new bright red um, gorgeous twigs and then the next year you take that other third that you didn't get to and then the next year you take the other third and by the end of three years you'll have a bright red um, red twig dogwood again. So a tweet we just got, any tips for growing edible plants through all three seasons and during winter? Uh, Absolutely. Um, Season extension, kind of, I mentioned earlier a rudimentary um, cold frame. That'll get you through um, three seasons at least. Um, Also, just making sure you're planting the right plant in the right season. Um, So cold season crops should be, you know, March, April, May. Um, warm season crops are going to be May, end of May, June through, um, you know, our tomatoes and peppers were still bearing into, you know, early October. But you got to start those cool season crops early enough so they get a good start before the, we start losing um, sunlight. So start those in early August for bearing in um, October, November, even into December. And then get through those winter months by bringing some herbs inside, um, planting microgreens on a very simple tabletop um, uh grow light situation, um, planting sprouts, mushrooms. There's lots of things that you can grow locally that don't require um, the outdoors. One, let's try to take uh, another call if we can. Uh, Mudes, uh, you have a question about walnuts? Y- yes. What is it? I have a walnut tree and I wanted to know uh, the best way to harvest the walnuts. I, I really get a, a lot of good yield from the tree and how do I harvest those walnuts? Well, I'm assuming that since walnut trees get quite statuesque, that it's a quite large tree. I would not recommend, like, scaling the tree and um, 
picking the uh, nuts off of there. There are professional grade um, harvesting tools that you can get, but they tend to be kind of expensive. Um, the best thing I would recommend is just try and keep, stay observant and keep an eye on it. And as nuts fall to the ground at, when they're in their green, they have that green um, kind of fruit around the nut. Um, pick them up before the squirrels do and then let them cure um, where the squirrels can't get them. Eliza, one last question for mm-hmm. you as we wrap up here. Uh, final tips for gardeners in the winter in this off season. You mentioned at the beginning, keep an eye on your tools. What else is a good thing to be doing this time of year? Um, learning more. I mean, calling into this show, talking to me, talking to um, co- coming up to the Chicago Botanic Garden, visiting our plant information 